I would like to say to my brothers and sisters, the Nestle, I give you an Ethiopian greeting uh, from most of the cultures that occupy that land. Where when Brother Brath make reference to my wife Gertrude, she was temporarily out of the room, so I think I will introduce you to her again. So, with a real Mrs. Benny, you can please stand. <laughs> traveling tonight with a very good friend of mine and I know most of you would be lost for word when I introduce him and his title. The Reverend Sam Brown <laughs> is a friend of mine and a Baptist minister. <laughs> Sam Brown. Uh, he's doing his stuff in the vineyards of Queens, way out in Long Island. And you know, being a friend of mine, he's catching hell <laughs> in the pulpit. Uh, what I am doing now, after 53 years, starting in 1939, isn't accidental and at the same time I did not plan it this way. I was warned by my father that what I was doing as a youngster could only result in one of two things. And my father then told me, you don't take a job if you're going to be a gambler. There is no successful gambler working. If you're a gambler, you must spend all of your time to understand the tricks and chonies of gambling. You can't waste time and working. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. So when I started, didn't understand where I was going, I took a career of civil engineering. Having that hasn't given me what I was looking for in my inner self, and at the time I wasn't even conscious of it. I turned to anthropology, cultural anthropology. That still did not meet my need, and I went into Moorish history. None of these things satisfy my need, and then I went to my father's first profession, law. Neither of these things satisfy my inner need, but they give me a preparation in order to fight what was to come way up the road. And so it is that I had a last qualification to make. And that was to decide whether I was going towards money or whether I was going towards a struggle. And probably at the time when I started, I probably was not too clear on which way I had to go. So like any other young man, there were times in my youth when I too saw the flashiness of a car and thought that it meant something other than transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Clothing and everything else. And I made quite a few mistakes in those days. But things start to gel when I realize 
there was a sharp distinction between going towards wealth and going towards a peace of mind. And quite early I made the decision that sometimes you have to take the route of the peace of mind, but the peace of mind did not necessarily mean the comfort of not paining. To have the peace of mind meant to go to jail, it meant to be spattered on on, it meant to be shot fired to you, your car uh, attacked, your person, and family problems. But the peace of mind came that while you were in jail, you could sleep unless they were pur uh, purposely at the time harassing you physically. And I had all of those experiences. The ultimate and last point of this came in the entitlement of August with the Egyptian experience I had because the Egyptian government and many of its officials anticipated my mind, though my actions did not give away my mind. The Egyptian government summarized, or members within it summarized, that my total behavior from 1939 until 1991 was because of my commitment to my people, the Nubians and that it, they felt that anyone dedicated so to their people will probably do anything in that effort to free their people. And so when it was that the struggle came for an Arab Egyptian trying to wrest from me that dream I had in placing Nubia again to the world by establishing this Nubian festival, which may have sung good and playful, pleasurable, and everything like that, a holiday in the stars, so to speak, that they saw in this a totally different thing, which it was. They saw in this an attempt to bring to the world, and on the world scale internationally, the Nubian people highlights as those of Egypt. True, they were. But the charges against me for how this was to come about was totally erroneous and the persons who plotted this in conjunction with international bodies were fighting against me at that point, not as Joseph ben Cannon. I have been barred from countries before. I have been placed in jail by countries that have been escorted back to the airport by the head of state of St. Kitts, Bradshaw. <laughs> So I had known all of these experiences and knew they would come from different sources for different reasons. But what was the primary reason that I had reached this point? So I never asked, why me? I never asked the question, I will never ask the question, why not me? For what I was engaged in doing and will be continuing to do when I return to Egypt on the 19th of October cannot be stopped. And someone asks, how you mean it can't be stopped? You're a human being, you could die like anybody else. Well, if I, if I die, I will die either by a gun, a knife, or just call me, this, uh, die in some black woman's hands. I mean, arms. <laughs> Uh, 
what you know about that sort of thing. <laughs> but nevertheless, I will die. And someday must die, based upon what I'm seeing. <laughs> but I will continue to the last of the breath to be struggling towards Nubia. And so with that, I made it a possible that money never played an important part, though it is important. The pursuit of it is very difficult, and at times it makes it uneasy for me to perform what I have to perform. But what is it? Well, in 1936, uh, and then subsequently in 39, when I made my first move in terms of Egypt, then I started what happened to me in August. We expect that only when we do things momentarily in one day, the reaction to what we have done just a few minutes prior to what comes down on us, we feel is that the thing that actually we're paying for. No. What happened to me in August 1991 began in 1939, and this was the response to what I did then. Between 1939 and 1991, what happened was the intensity of what I had begun in 1939. And because I knew it, when I went to Papua New Guinea, arrived in Papua New Guinea with $19 in my pocket, not knowing where I'm going, it didn't bother me because when I was assured that 99% of the population looked like me, I knew I didn't need more than $19. I didn't know I didn't need $19 <laughs> because I knew what I had to do to live among them people. I had certain skills. I had the skill of law, the skill of engineering, and the skill of historical research. And there's no way that I could make contact with anyone there and we could communicate that I would need bread to eat. Since it is that my objectivity was always the African people. When I was teaching at Columbia University, I'm going to go into history, but this is important to understand me. I was simultaneously lecturing two blocks from here exactly on the southwest corner of 125th Street, right in front of the chock full of nuts. I would come down from, from Teachers College where I was teaching two courses to 125th Street to the University of Hard Knocks. <laughs> and there I took all kind of abuse because my language was not proper. I did not know to speak to my brothers and my sisters. I too spoke with long syllabic words. I was the epitome of a British house slave. <laughs> All my words were so properly spoken and sometimes I had to trouble over my accent and the words to get to my people who had not heard a word I was saying until I started to learn the word motherfucker. <laughs> when I learned to say that and to speak it with all the strength and vigor, as against a, a gentleman who mates with his partner, I had no one to understand me. And then I learned something in the Christian church. I spoke the language of the people. Some of you can't stand it, of course, as the people. But I, for the first time, I was able to communicate with all of my people, those in the big house and those on the plantation. 
Previous to that, I was communicating solely with the big house. And the big house could not hear me because what I had to say was not for the big house. What I had to say was for the audience here and the rest of the audience like you. I wanted to bring what I saw in Egypt to the average African man, woman, and child. Because I knew that what I had was a liberating device. I had seen my people sitting and praying for a wife or a husband, sitting and praying for a fur coat or a Mercedes Benz, <laughs> sitting and praying for all kind of frivolous nonsense, carrying it to the door of the Lord and leaving it there on the doorstep, coming back two weeks later and there it still was on the doorstep. <laughs> and I realized that the answer, though Though theosophy and religion has its value, it is not the way with it all. For I realize that the minister would be never, if, if going to the Lord in prayer was really the thing, hardly a minister would have been in the pulpit. I knew all that. I knew that what my people believed in was what Carter G. Woodson admonished us not to go in because it resulted in what he said at that time, the miseducation of the Negro. Marcus Messiah Garvey, whose son is here with us, one of the two, was a man who I looked at with a reverence not less than my own biological father. And I, meant, I remember in his teachings way down there when I grew up in the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, he asked the question, what is an education? For what purpose? He said, it's not necessarily what you take in. For more than often, you will have to let that same thing out. I'm paraphrasing, of course. And it had an impact on me. And what was the impact then? Was to have a knowledge, to know something, to see your people struggling for that knowledge, which is theirs, to see them being Pavlov eyes, like Pavlov dog and not being able to recognize that we are going down the aisle. First thing was to make my people, to free them from the Adam and Eve syndrome, free them from the guilt feeling, uh, guilt symptom of being responsible and something being diabolically wrong for having a child without a piece of paper from City Hall. Having them free from be calling themselves such as black sheep of the family. When this should be the proud point of the black family, it was denigrating to the family. To speak of everything and be afraid of it, the blackness of the night. And there's more blackness than there is light. To be afraid of all, your own skin and to be shocked by the mirror when the mirror revealed it. All these things I saw without coming out and speaking on the issue per se. It is at that time that I equally come, came to the United States and met with a little, a, a little a, a older boy. You would not think that we were ever boys. I met with a, a fellow from Georgia, little Bubba Clark, <laughs> a little bit older than I am. <laughs> and uh, so I, when, when we meet any place, I always have to give him first consideration. <laughs> but we met in the Schamburg, and I see a lady sitting down right on my right hand side, one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven rows back who was a mentor. 
And we don't speak about mentors. But the mentors have the point in helping to mold us. And I was partly molded by this woman, Miss Hudson, sitting right there. Will you stand up, Miss Hudson? Take a bow, take a bow. No, take a bow, you gotta take a bow. Take a bow. Yeah. I had to because you claim how beautiful the Shambug is, and that's what I'm talking about. What a beautiful place, what an intellectual place, everything about it. And of course, we give honor to Brother Otto Lange Schomburg and others. But I am a living witness for the many, many nights till 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, coming back from meeting with that young lady there, going home by herself towards the Hudson River, trying to get what you now got there. So I think that the old building, at least the old building, should carry Gene Hudson's name. <laughs> and let me go into what it is that was so revealing and changing in me as a young man and subsequently now as an approaching old man. <laughs> it was that which Garvey was speaking about I had discovered. It was no longer theory when he said the tricolors of Africa, which you don't even use no more. You talk about liberation flag. Garvey never spoke anything about no liberation flag. It was the red, black, and green trimmed in gold. And when I went in the tombs and temples of Egypt and saw the red, black, and green 5,000 years before Jesus, when I went there in tombs and saw red, white, and blue, also as another symbol in ancient Egypt, having seen these also in Sudan and Ethiopia, I'm going up, back up country, up south. I then was shocked. A man who had himself not gone physically to any part of the African continent, but totally spiritual transmission. It is then that when I got in the tomb of Seti Won, at the temple of Seti Won, at a place called Abydos, and realized that our people had been using this place as a holy land. There was no God by the name of Jehovah yet when our people were using it as a holy land. Therefore, of course, there was no Abraham yet and there was no Moses to lead anyone from any place yet. <laughs> there was no Jerusalem and of course, Jesus didn't exist. Not on the tongue of anyone. No one knew the name. And it was the Holy Land of my people. And there was no Bethlehem. No Allah existed. And therefore, no Muhammad ibn Abdullah. And therefore, no Mecca. Not even Medina. And then I further started to think beyond doing just the research. And other things started to came, come to me and another damning thing came to me was the concept of the Immaculate Conception. As I walked through that temple and stumbled into the room and looked and see an erected penis perpendicular to the body of the image of the person being there. And by that time, knowing to read enough to understand what was going on in this, I noticed it was the resurrection 
And I thought for the longest of while when I heard that the resurrection of Jesus was a spiritual resurrection. It has nothing to do with something physical. But here was a rite of Cyrus with both a spiritual and a physical resurrection. And the symbol of resurrection was the penis of a man that the ancient Africans were not afraid to use their sexual organ, uh, organ symbolically to express point. I had seen this in other temples as I looked at goddess Mut, stripped naked, and the text saying, goddess Nuts, exposing heaven to the world, a vagina. And I had heard of the word heaven, and I was taught to look up in the sky, especially when the big clouds passed. <laughs> I had used, I had been in heaven. I had come out of heaven one, one day on the December 31st, and didn't even know I'd been in heaven. <laughs> I, had a, I had a... Because everybody was telling me, it's not there. I, would, I lay down with it. I had learned to even go back in it. <laughs> and I was ashamed to know that millions of brothers couldn't recognize heaven, and that's why they were beating it with clubs, kicking it, kicking heaven full of new birth. Couldn't even recognize heaven. And I'd even call the products of heaven bastard, illegitimate, and so forth. This kind of news had to be, to had to be told, but who's gonna listen? Who's going to listen when they are already reached the epitome of what brother, my brother had said in the miseducation of the Negro? Further, as I examine the whole basis for our living, understanding the concept of spirituality, Understanding for the first time that our people bring to the world the concept of a soul, but not only a soul, the concept of the law of balance, the law of opposites, that that law was fundamental and never once could be upset. Our people had even carried into the concept of balance, the law of opposite, and so that just like we are seeing melanin today, our people had seen it way back there in the concept of balance. It was hard to put these things that I was now seeing as my pick and shovel dug into the earth and the blisters came there was no time to worry about the blisters because the information that was being revealed was something that I found to be my greatest difficulty because what now that I've got this, who am I going to tell that can understand me? Can I tell my mother? No. She was a midwife and should have, but her background, her training. Could I tell my father? No. Though he encouraged me, because neither of the two could understand because of the background. How now would I tell my people? I, re I realized it. When I went to the street in Harlem, it was not the first time, because in Puerto Rico, I had gone to the street with Don Albiso Campo. I had been in jail in 1935 with the black shirts in Puerto Rico at the university. I had gone to the street to tell people whatever way because I was not interested in the title intellectual. Today, when people condemn me for not being an intellectual of the PhD type, 
It, they think that they're bothering me. They don't. I've given up. I surrendered the name last Saturday before last and at, at um, my lecture at First World. I gave it back. I turned it back. I don't need the damn thing. I didn't need it then. <laughs> but I needed it. I couldn't go in certain places my brother and sister. Hadn't I used that white man's certification, I would not have been able to get in. I no longer lead it. But I refuse to use it on what I consider the epitome of the black man and the particularly the black woman's value. Never did I put the PhD on my works because I refuse to let the white man certify what I am doing. And thus I understand what, poor, what Brother Chancellor evaded him. I understood because I've been there and I understand the browning of my people or the lightning of my people. I could look at my mother and see it. And I realized that I can't blame my people for their browning. Therefore, the light one among my people and the dark one among my people had to be treated equally because they were not responsible for what happened to them by the Arab slave trade or the European slave trade. It is that, because of that, I was able to understand the invasion of the first part of Africa, and that is the northeast section of Africa, now called by some the Middle East. <laughs> I understood what happened as the hikes, as the first foreign people to come in, in our land, came in to plunder, no different than the current foreigners in the same land plundering today. I understood it. You know, to work and just put dates and events and figures, and you said, I said, research without understanding, without feeling, without seeing. You can do that very easily. You could do that easily and go put down the pen in the afternoon or the typewriter, go down the corner, take a shot of anything higher, lower, and in between her, or anything like that, and don't make a, take a plane to Haiti and say, I had a beautiful time in squalor, take a plane to Georgia or something and have a beautiful time and come back mesmerized with alcohol in the plane, flying higher than the plane. <laughs> you can do that if you do the research, but the research means nothing to you personally. It is thus that when I went in the tomb of Ramesses the Sixth, in particular, and look at the black woman up in the ceiling. I could turn my mind to New York, to St. Croix, Puerto Rico, and say, it can't be the same woman because this woman is over the head of Ramesses the Sixth. She is shown naked back to back. I thought of the Caribbean Calip Kaiso song. Back to back. You know what it is. <laughs> and I'm saying, is it is the picture of the black woman up there with the stars and the moons on her body? The brother put it up there. Black men, artists, put her as heaven. But black men in Harlem on 125th Street had his foot in black women behind and their guts. Is it the same black man that put it in there? What had happened to us in the transition between the Nile Valley, the slave ships, the crossing of the ocean, 
and our sojourn in the Caribbeans and then after the Caribbeans coming up here in 16, uh, 19 or 20 in v Jamestown, Virginia. What else was to be learned was all of these concepts of the bat and the card, the spirituality. To understand that our people, call them Egyptians, Nubians, Meroites, any name you want to call them, even nigger if it feels, it feels you better, because your sons and daughters just calling everybody nigger in the subway <laughs> and every place. <laughs> that too had to have to be put in context. It could not be that the Hyksos did this, and then come the Assyrians and we kicked them out with Ashib and Apinal. And then